Okay, so uh, this is a particular honor for me, uh, and I'm very appreciative of the organizers for inviting me. I don't know that I really feel worthy of the legacy of Professor Nambu. I'm gonna talk about some work uh, done with uh, postdocs and students I've named here. Some of it is uh, in the recent past, some is going on. Uh, and some of what I'll say owes, uh, owes, uh, owes a lot to uh, recent, some recent conversations with Nathan Seiberg. Uh, so, of course, we're here honoring uh, the memory of uh, Professor Nambu. Uh, and I also, uh, I, I did not spend expend, extended periods at the University of Chicago. I, did, I knew Professor Nambu, but not extremely well. Uh, but he is, was a figure throughout uh, much of my career. Uh, beginning with my graduate student days, I first encountered his work on symmetry breaking and the strong interactions, uh, and he has uh, since that time been one of my intellectual heroes. And this was reinforced during my years in City College, uh, where uh, my local mentor and hero was uh, Bunji Sakita, who himself was quite close to Nambu and often regaled me with stories, especially of the war years in Japan and the years right afterwards, and both his experiences and Nambu. And I finally got to know Nambu a little bit in the 80s, uh, and all of my interactions with him were very stimulating and uh, enhanced by his charm and wit. And I remember many conversations in Chicago, but remarks he made, uh, and, and I think I, especially after, uh, from Peter's uh, little talk this morning, I now pre maybe appreciate their significance any more, uh, at the, the Arg this famous Argonne meeting, which I believe was 1984, he was either 84 or 85, uh, on string theory, uh, which were thoughtful, uh, but also cautionary, and they still stand out in my mind. Uh, and my final interactions came with him uh, shortly after he received his Nobel Prize. Uh, like many, I sent him a ca congratulatory note, and I immediately got back a uh, mailbox is full. And about a year later, I got the nicest note from him. Uh, very thoughtful, and unfortunately, I, it's, uh, it's, it's a, just long enough ago my mail doesn't go back that far. I would have liked to have shown it. Uh, anyway, uh, in my own professional work, Nambu's influence is perhaps uh, heaviest in the areas of string theory and in the appearance of light scalars uh, in the case of continuous global symmetry breaking. Uh, his work with uh, Jonah Licinio is instructive for me, and I was thinking about it as I prepared this talk, in that it takes a model which in detail you really can't take that terribly seriously, uh, but extracts important and universal features. Uh, and somewhat, I would say, hope is a very modest effort in this style. Uh, and while much of my discussion today will center on Nambu Goldstone bosons, I'll also consider some questions in strong dynamics uh, where fermionic condensates play important roles. So I hope uh, this is a little bit of, I say, a very modest uh, effort to think about Nambu. Okay, so just as a reminder, I don't know if you could see that that well, but this is just the, the famous Nambu Jonah Licinio paper. What I actually wanted to point to is a remark in the conclusion, which it may be hard to read, but, oops. Uh, but, let's see if I can get the pointer here. Thank you. Yes. Uh, we were already, already remarked before that the model treated here is not realistic enough to be compared with the actual nucleon problem. Our purpose was to show new possibility exists for field theory to be richer and more complex than, been, than has been hitherto envisioned. So this is, again, I said, the spirit of uh, which I was alluding to in the previous slide. Okay, so, uh, so I say, in, in his famous work on symmetry breaking, the light scalars were the pi ends of the strong interactions. Today, um, particularly important roles for light scalars often arise in the context of cosmology, and ax, ac, examples include axions as dark matter, okay, but also candidates for the inflaton of slow roll inflation. And that's largely what I'm gonna focus on here. Okay, and it, indeed, the following statements are often made about inflation, and I, I see them a lot recently. So the, so you'll see statements like the Planck, the Planck satellite has ruled out hybrid inflation. That's actually in the Planck paper. Uh, if tensor fluctuations are observed requiring Planck scale variations of the inflaton, then inflation is, is necessarily either natural or chaotic. Uh, and three, in the case of natural inflation, this must be understood as either something called monodromy inflation or something like aligned axions. Okay, and what I'd like to do today is push back a little bit on some of these statements. Okay. So, 
So in the first part of this talk, I'm going to talk, I'm going to say a little bit about natural inflation or monodromy inflation. Uh, I'll start by saying a few words about chaotic, chaotic inflation and natural inflation. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about problems for natural inflation uh, and some of their solutions, monodromy inflation, aligned axions. This will actually lead me also to remark on the weak gravity conjecture, which Kumran uh, just spoke about. Uh, uh, I talk about aspects of monodromy in field theory, okay, and then we'll summarize a little bit, talking a little bit about the plausibility of chaotic or natural inflation. Okay, maybe that will, and that some of that is why uh, my the reason I asked this question of Kumran at the end before. Okay, so uh, so let me say a few words first of all about small field versus large field inflation. Okay, so there are various categories of inflation models that people talk about. Uh, large here, large field means phi much greater. There were much greater uh, is a subject of interpretation, but perhaps an order of magnitude, maybe a little less than that, uh, and Planck. Uh, and here one speaks about chaotic inflation and natural inflation and this monodromy inflation. Uh, and for example, here one predicts potentially observable gra gravitational waves. We had a lot of excitement uh, in the last uh, a year or so ago with a possible observation in bicep two. Okay. Uh, small field here is phi less than, much less than M Planck and uh, very often associated with something people call hybrid inflation. Okay. There are no observable gravity waves. Uh, and, and for hybrid inflation, the challenge is to, to understand the spectral index as reported by Planck, which I quote here is about 0 0.9603. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the theoretical challenges in each framework. Uh, so uh, for uh, chaotic inflation, okay, so chaotic inflation is inflation with, a, for an, with an inflaton where one typically writes a monom monomial of potential, something like phi squared or phi or phi to the three halves. Okay? Uh, and, uh, and in order that this work, one needs, first of all, an extremely tiny coefficient for whatever is the monomial, and you need also to understand how you suppress large numbers of other operators. It's not just one operator, which has to be small. Uh, I, uh, Hitoshi would teach us how to count them, I guess. Uh, uh, and the, sort of the question is why? What, why, why? Why might that occur? Uh, natural inflation is, uh, I'll explain a little bit more, I guess I didn't put it right here, what natural inflation is, but for those who don't know, natural inflation is basically the idea that one has inflation due to uh, an axion, okay? But this axion has to have a decay constant large compared to the Planck mass, and this doesn't seem to be realized in string theory, okay? And this can be seen both in a failure of explicit constructions and has been elevated to a, to a principle through this uh, as, or a, one outcome of a principle of this so-called weak gravity conjecture. Uh, various alternatives have been explored, monodromy inflation, which is the one I'll talk about most here, uh, things called multinatural inflation, aligned axions. These are actually all things I'm thinking about and this group of people I talked about are considering, but I'm going to focus, I say, on this first one. Uh, and then there's small field inflation, uh, here, here I'm going to just make a few remarks uh, l later in the talk, and in particular, I want to show, point out that Planck scale corrections are still important here, uh, and, uh, and 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 one needs very tiny couplings to encounter to account, for example, for delta rho over rho, rho. Okay. Now I should say, maybe in the spirit of some of the things that uh, Kummer was talking about, more generally in any framework, it's challenging to make predictions which you could tie to a detailed microscopic picture. But in any case, I'm going to propose some alternative viewpoints on some of these questions uh, in this talk. So I guess I keep forgetting I have this button. OK. So let me uh, talk a little bit about Nambu Goldstone bosons as the actors in inflation, or, or situation where that might be the case. And this is called, as it goes by the name of natural inflation, OK, and has and various variants. Okay. Uh, so here one has a field, an axion, okay, uh, and a potential which goes like some energy scale to the fourth, uh, cosine theta over Fa. Okay. And if you look at the slow roll conditions, so the slow roll conditions, for example, involve this parameter eta, which is roughly mp squared times v double prime over v, second derivative of v over v, and this has to be much less than one. Okay. And that requires that Fa is much greater than mp. Okay. And this turns out to be difficult to re to realize in string theory. So when you look at various sorts of constructions that look like, sort of in the spirit of some of the things Kummer talked about, which look like they should predict 
pr provide a large FE. A, in fact, that turns out to be hard. Uh, and this led, it leads, in fact, to this weak gravity conjecture, this notion of gravity as the weakest force, which has as an outcome a, 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 an assertion that FA is not parametrically large compared to MP. So various alternatives have been discussed, as I said, and okay, I'm going to describe uh, one of these here. So I want to describe this notion of monodromy inflation. Okay, so I, I associate this with work of Silberstein and Westall, who constructed, uh, who talked about various sorts of string models, uh, where they argued that axions can can wind in a way that I'll sort of clarify with some field theory examples in a moment. Uh, so that effectively the, the axion periodicity, the periodicity, this A over, periodicity of this parameter A over F is not 2 pi, but 2 pi times some large number, okay? Large enough that even though F is, might be small compared to the Planck mass, we can effectively have an F which is very large, okay? Uh, and in fact, they argue that the potentials you get are, are, are in fact more like the potentials of chaotic inflation. Uh, monomial potentials, for example, phi to the two-thirds over a rather broad range in the field space. Okay. Now, the string constructions involved here are, are rather complicated. Okay. They involve things that are not, uh, that I don't, I think most people would argue are not under terribly good control. They don't, they're not super symmetric, they're not whatever, but I, I don't, I don't want to make contentious comments here. Uh, but it's interesting to consider uh, what this might look like in field theory, and it's actually rather simple. So I keep doing this, okay? So as an example, I, let me consider a supersymmetric gauge theory for starters, okay? We're gonna talk about non-supersymmetric theories as well in a few minutes, but let me think about SUN supersymmetric gauge theory, okay? Uh, where uh, I have a mass term for, so just, this is just a pure SUN theory, so they're just gauge bosons and gauge genos, gluinos if you like, okay? Uh, and in that theory, gluinos condense, okay? Well, this is something we know very well now, Okay, gluinos condense, uh, so there's a condensate of lambda lambda. This is, you know, sort of something that should have cheered uh, Nambu, okay, which goes like lambda cubed, the scale of the theory. It goes like uh, some phase, e to the 2 pi i k over n, I'm going to talk about that in a second, uh, and if there's a theta parameter, it goes like e to the i theta over n. Uh, focusing on this, okay, this represent, this term represents the fact that the, this, uh, the underlying theory has a discrete Zn symmetry. Okay, that Zn is spontaneously broken. Okay, so there are n possible choices of phase for this condensate. Okay, and now if we take this theory and let's just, uh, you know, you know, we don't love supersymmetry that much. Let's just add a mass term for the Gagino. Okay, but let's add, add a small mass term. Okay, small compared to the scale lambda. Okay, and then uh, this V of theta looks like m lambda n lambda cubed. Okay, cosine theta over n plus two pi k over n. So we get a potential just replacing this field by its expectation value, which is sort of what the doctor ordered, okay? Uh, if I think of this theta for a moment as an axion. So I had an axion, sort of thought I had an axion with the periodicity two pi over n, uh, uh, two pi, I'm sorry, two pi. Now it has a period, looks like it has a periodicity two pi n, okay? That's really compensated for by the fact that if I change uh, the uh, theta by 2 pi, I can change this k. I can change the branch of this condensate, okay? So as I say, the near period is it looks like theta goes to theta plus 2 pi n, and as I say, we compensate that by changing the branch, okay? So I can say I want to elevate theta to a Nambu Goldstone boson, okay? So theta is some axion divided by Fa, okay? And as the axion moves, Okay, it crosses over to these other branches, but provided m lambda is small, so as I, as I, as I move along in theta, as theta changes by two pi, there's eventually a lower energy state, which I might tunnel to, but provided m lambda is small, the tunneling rate can be low, it'll be suppressed by some, uh, by an exponential of some inverse power of m lambda, okay? So I can imagine trying to do inflation along the lines of natural inflation, okay, where the field varies slowly, uh, and, uh, and I'm safe against, you know, I'm not often going to fall off this cliff to this other, to this other state. Okay, so for, for, for sufficiently large n, uh, uh, and say n greater than 100 or so, and suitably small m lambda, this would be a model for successful natural inflation. 
Now, whether you like it or not, that's another matter. And it sort of goes along with the swampland idea, whether, whether it makes sense to, you know, whether you want to talk about models where you know, gauge groups which are SU100 or whatever, that's, that's an interesting question. And whether or not uh, there is some uh, more stringy story which looks like this, is, I'll, I'll also leave as, as a question. Now, I want to talk a little bit about other field theory real realizations of this kind of monodromy. And I think for many people, this is kind of in the backs of their minds when they talk about this. Okay, so I'm going to take us back a long time, but it's something that will maybe gets us, well, first of all, it gets us close to time to, you know, uh, uh, viewed on that time scale to the era of Nambu's work, and it uh, uh, and brings us closer to issues that Nambu worried about in, 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 QC, in strong dynamics. Okay. So Witten, uh, already in about 1979, uh, discussed uh, the eta prime. He discussed the, uh, and he wrote down a sort of current algebra for the eta prime at large n. So he, had large, and he argued at large n, the anomaly could be treated as a perturbation. And he argued that one should not think of the eta prime potential and theta dependent effects also as, uh, as rising from instantons. These, he argued, would be, should be thought of as order e to the minus n but rather from resumming of, in some way, I'm missing an M there, of perturbation theory, okay? And then from large N counting arguments, he wrote a potential for the eta prime, or if you like, a potential for the mesons, uh, which was V of U, U is, the, is now the meson field, okay? So it's E to the I, pi A, uh, uh, lambda A over 2F or something, but we're including in U a determinant. We're not requiring its determinant be one, so the eta prime is essentially the determinant. And he added this piece here, proportional to one over N times log determinant U plus theta. This is just a basically, if theta is not there, this is just a mass term for the eta prime, proportional to one over N. Okay, and here again, we have some kind of monodromy, okay? The theta, this axion, looks like it can wander some distance. Okay, so it can wander a distance larger than two pi. Okay, now, uh, and the potential here is some kind of monomial. So it's sort of thing you want even for, you know, thinking of sort of chaotic inflation in the back of our minds or something like that. Okay, and so for example, for small m, okay, uh, if we take m small but fixed and very large n, this potential, for example, has some large number of minima proportional to n. Basically, if you like, if you think of theta as being restricted, for example, from zero to two pi, okay, corresponding to letting the eta prime pick up additional uh, pieces proportional to two pi, or eta prime over f proportional to two pi. Okay, so we could ask, what are these? Okay, so this is just sort of puzzling. What are these, what happened to the theta or eta prime periodicities? Okay, and over what range, so over what range of fields might we trust this kind of description? Okay, so, now, in fact, subsequently, uh, Witten thought about return to this problem uh, and argued for a similar behavior in, a pure, in pure gauge theory, a similar kind of monodromy. So this is just a pure SUN gauge theory, based in part on thinking about uh, ADSC, uh, the ADS-CFT correspondence. And he wrote a potential which looked like this. He wrote a via theta, which was minimum the minimum uh, as, uh, over k, c lambda to the fourth theta plus two pi k squared, okay? So in this case, uh, this is not quite a model for the monodromy inflation we might want because there's no, if, 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 as I move in theta, if I move more than theta, in, in two pi more than theta, it looks like I'm gonna, ton I, you know, there's no reason to think that the tunneling should be suppressed. It's not clear I can think about all these branches as existing over very large ranges of theta. Theta. But still, this is a kind of interesting example of this sort of monodromy. Okay. Now, in fact, though, if you look, go back to the Susie case I talked about, we have exactly this sort of structure. Okay. So in the supersymmetric case, the case where we have gauginos and, and a small mass, okay, we wrote a potential, a potential for theta, which looked very similar. It was m lambda, n lambda cubed. I should say I want to scale m lambda as with n. Uh, if it, I, is, I believe, the right way to do this, n scaling, okay? So this is really like an n squared term. And then I have cosine theta over n plus two pi k over n, okay? So that's, it, for a very large n, over most of the range, over some range of theta, I can expand this, and this is exactly this form that Witten wrote, okay? So in this case, for small m lambda, okay, we have literally this picture. 
Uh, and in this case, for small m lambda, we also have stability, uh, some approximate stability or metastability along these various branches. And we see how many there are. We see there, there are n branches. Okay? Uh, and, uh, and then we could say, well, what happens if we crank up m lambda? Okay, so if we crank up m lambda, we should recover an ordinary QCD. Okay, for a large m lambda, there's no reason to expect stability for, uh, for, uh, for large theta plus 2 pi k. Okay? And it would seem unlikely that there are order in uh, metastable vacuum. Uh, as best I can. Uh, but basically, I'm just, ba well, let me just refer back to this formula I wrote. So when I, right, uh, let's see what I do. There it is, right? So for, for small m lambda, what I said is basically, so, so what do you have to do in the, in, the, in the, so we're now in the supersymmetric theory. Okay, so this is, this is my, my homage to, to, to Nambu. Okay, so I'm using this as a model. It's not a real model for QCD, but it's kind of a toy model. Okay, and so now as for small m lambda, okay, what do I have? What is, what, how do I change branches? How do I move between these different branches? Okay, I move these, these moving between these branches corresponds to changing this value of k. Okay, this requires changing the values of, feel, of uh, fields with masses of order lambda. Not, M, not little m lambda, okay? So that's why the tunneling is suppressed. I'm going between, the barrier I have to go to is, has a height scale by lambda, okay? Uh, and, the, uh, and the splitting of the states is of order little m lambda. So I suppress the tunneling. And then all I'm saying, I'm not saying anything more here. I, I have nothing more profound here to say than just that as I increase, uh, as I increase little m lambda, uh, they, uh, okay, if, if I make m lambda very large, I have ordinary QCD with no, with just gluons, and if, as I increase things gradually, this behavior can change in qualitative ways. So these, these, state, these different branches, as I move along the branches, things are no longer stable. Okay? It doesn't, it's not clear, you know, here in one case I had sort of this large number of things I could call states, and it's not clear that that description makes sense anymore. That probably breaks down somewhere. Okay, okay so that was the idea here. Okay. Okay, so let me also consider now something. So this eta prime story has always puzzled me, and this, uh, and, and, and there's, a, and, and, and this kind of picture gives a kind of simple explanation of what's going on there. So I think I mentioned uh, here that, for example, there for for very large n lambda, there are all these uh, there there are all these minima. They're not degenerate, as I think someone mentioned, but they're all these minima of sort of, of some number of minima proportional to n. What in the world are those? Uh, and if we just repeat this story, okay, for supersymmetric QCD with a small number of flavors, it's easiest to do it for one, okay, for a small number of flavors, we can repeat the analysis, the same result analysis that gives the Gigino condensate and so on, gives a potential uh, that looks like this. So I'm going to, particularly, I'm going to do this in a case where I've broken the supersymmetry, okay. It, uh, I have introduced the Gagino mass, and I have introduced a certain hierarchy of masses of symmetry breaking. So the Gagino mass, small compared to lambda, uh, uh, large compared to uh, scalar masses, squark, Susie breaking scalar masses, and those large compared to a supersymmetric quark mass. Okay, uh, in that case, we get a potential, and I think I'm missing something here. Yeah, I'm missing a factor of uh, m q. Okay, but we get a potential which looks something like this. Okay, it's proportional to uh, to to add this m lambda. It's but it, what I really want to stress is it involves a cosine. Okay, uh, a cosine of this two pi k again plus theta. And now we have plus eta prime over f eta divided by n all squared. Okay, so again if I expand, take n large. Okay, stay away from uh, two pi uh, from two pi for this argument and expand. Uh, in powers of the argument here, I get exactly Witten's eta prime action, okay, with the correct n scaling. So one of the things that Witten stressed is that the eta prime potential in large n counting have uh, successive powers of eta prime come with factors of one over n, okay, uh, and that's here. It's actually suppression. Successive powers of eta prime over f eta come with powers of one over n, okay. That's built in here, okay, uh, and. As before, in this limit, there are n metastable vacua, okay, associated with this Zn symmetry of the supersymmetric theory, okay. 
Now again, so I'm not going to tell you what the theory does for, lar for as I break the, as I now allow the masses to rise and break the supersymmetry badly as I go over to real QCD, okay? Uh, but in general, this metastability we don't expect to survive, okay? And this kind of uh, vacuum structure uh, isn't likely to survive, okay? So um, you see I'm, I'm wandering a lot into QCD here. I, we'll come back to inflation if I have time later, <laughs> okay? I'm uh, sorry? M tilde enters because, so, so I, I didn't want to take too many slides, but to, to do this computation, what you do is basically, you start in the limit where MQ is very sm small. In that limit, there is this non-perturbative superpotential, okay? Uh, you take that and you minimize now the potential that arises from that and M tilde, okay? So that fixes the scalar webs, okay? Then, uh, then there's a perturbation which depends on the phase, Okay, I'm treating that as a perturbation because MQ is small. I get this structure. I'm sorry, that's why I say, I, I, sorry I left out uh, factors of MQ here. Uh, and uh, so you actually can compute this thing. You, now, as I say, in the spirit again of this kind of, this is a, I want to say I'm invoking Nambu a lot. Uh, you know, in the spirit of looking, this is a silly model for QCD, okay, this particular limit, okay, but, you know, and we can, but it produces, Sort of the formula that Witten wanted, wants us to write, okay, and then we can ask, is that really the correct formula when we are in a more realistic, as we vary these parameters and go to a situation that's more realistic? Okay. Okay. Um, so, uh, okay, so, so, so now to be a little contentious, uh, I have a slide, title, slide here titled, How Badly Do Instant Times Lie? Okay, because I want to think about a question that, again, has been around for, uh, for a long time. In these, in these 1979 papers, Witten uh, noted uh, that his e to the minus n argument for the irrelevance of instantons is formal due to infrared divergences, but he sort of dismissed this as a loophole. Okay, and I want to say a few words about this. I'm not really going to answer this question, but it's interesting to consider this large N ideology in light of facts we now understand about supersymmetric theories. In particular, uh, we can ask in what sense are instanton effects of order e to the minus N at large N. Okay, so let me start with uh, pure supersymmetric gauge theory. Here, Gageinos contends, okay, and the condensate can be computed by studying a theory with NC minus one, number of color minus one flavors, first at small mass where we can compute everything precisely, and then taking advantage of holomorphy to go to large mass. Okay, this a, and the Gageino condensate survives at large N, okay, even though it's an instanton effect, and how does this work? Okay, so there are various ways to describe this, but one is to say that in the underlying theory, okay, we have this super potential, this is the one I didn't write down for the previous analysis, something like this. Okay, lambda to the 2n plus 1 over determinant q bar q plus m q bar q. Okay, this lambda to the 2n plus 1 is order e to the minus n. Okay, so this lambda to the minus 1 is e to the minus 8 pi squared over g squared, which is e to the minus n. Okay, and it does arise from instantons. But at the stationary points of the superpotential, the determinant q bar q is also order e to the minus n. Okay, and the expectation value of w is order 1. Okay, so this object, uh, is the, the object, and that object at, in, in, uh, is expectation value of lambda lambda when you take the mass to be large. Okay. So let me reconsider consider this argument directly in, in the low energy field theory. Okay. So uh, there's an old set of calculations going back to Schiffman and collaborators. Okay where they study correlators of 2n gauginos in just the pure gauge theory, pure supersymmetric gauge theory, and they found this goes like c, this is not nf, but this should be c lambda to the 3n, okay? And this is order e to the minus n, it's e, it is in fact e to the minus 8 pi squared over g squared, because one is, cal and here it's, this is because one is calculating a very high dimension operator, okay? It's this lambda, so lambda itself is not e to the minus n, but we've raised it to the power, I'm sorry about this nf, uh, but we've raised it to a power of order n, okay? All right, all right, and so that's fine. Now this should be, as, as Schiffman and all noted in these original papers, you would expect if this calculation was correct, okay, and, uh, that this is, would be lambda lambda to the n, okay? But in fact, it's off by a finite factor, 
Okay? And this can be understood in terms of uh, basically dilute gas corrections. Okay? So it's been understood in a number of ways. Uh, there's a reference missing here due to, uh, to Hollywood and collaborators. Okay? So this can be understood as a, as a result of dilute gas corrections. Okay? Uh, so in other words, if I compute this object, and I think about computing this object with instantons, I have to sum over here this n is, uh, right, so, if, so, so this is being computed in the single instanton sector. So if n equals zero, I have one instanton. If n equals uh, one, I have an inst two, uh, two instantons and an anti-instanton and so on. Okay, and I have some expression like this, which is very infrared divergent. Rho is the instanton sales scale size. I have something which goes like e to the minus eight pi squared over g squared, okay, to a number. So this looks like e to the minus n time, ca capital N in the language of large n times one plus two n. Okay, it is highly inf infrared divergent though, and if I cut off the IR divergence at the scale lambda, okay, in fact, every term in this series is of order lambda to the three n. Okay, so I, this f is still creeping around here. Okay, all right. So for each term in the sum, there is no e to the minus n suppression. And in fact, this is consistent with known results where it's sort of, in various contexts, you can see that there are corrections in, in the winding number one sector, for example, which account for the discrepancy between the uh, Shipman and all calculation and the exact result. Okay. Uh, it's also consistent, it's all con also consistent with the theta dependence of the vacuum energy we talked about once one introduces a small uh, gauge genome mass term. Okay, so um, it does not necessarily prove anything, but I think it just says that this, you know, in terms of thinking about whether one might expect cosine, so what I'm really after is would you expect things like cosine behaviors or monomials or what have you, okay, and just to say that maybe this cosine behavior isn't so unreasonable, okay. So as I say, applying this sort of reasoning uh, in pure Q, uh, gauge QCD, cutting off the IR divergences above would suggest that the, the potential for theta goes like lambda to the fourth uh, uh, times some series of terms in cosine and theta. Uh, and similar con considerations in the theory with a single light, massive fermion would give something uh, of this form for the eta prime. Okay. Uh, and more generally, I should say this last sort of term uh, can be compatible with the ZNF symmetry you might naively expect in these sorts of theories. Okay. All right. So um, let's see. My my uh, time coach is. Okay. So, okay. So I can bore you a lot longer. Okay. Uh, so uh, I want. So so this is kind of the end of the first part. I want to sort of what lessons do I want to draw here for inflation? Well. First of all, I, I haven't said anything new, but I think chaotic inflation, just thinking about monomials only, doesn't seem that reasonable. It raises all the usual puzzles. Uh, and monodromy inflation, I think, uh, I would say here that sim there, there, we can find simple re realizations in field theory, but they require, for example, very ga large gauge groups, and I should also say some pe peculiar regions of parameters. Okay? And you could ask how plausible this is, and again, that gets to my swampland question, or such large groups common or typical. Uh, how plausible are the various string constructions, uh, again, the, involving some log interval of monomial growth in some axion-like field, not duplicated in field theory examples where at least one would seem to have greater control. So I want to return a little bit to other possibilities, uh, and I want to say that string theory suggests a, a different picture for inflation, which seems sort of obvious, but uh, hasn't been explored that extensively. Okay, so I want to talk about, in the second part, about non-compact string moduli as an arena for inflation. So I, in, this in the talk, I gave a title which was Nambu, Goldstone, Bosons, and Otherwise, and these are, this is the otherwise. Okay, so in string theory, especially with supersymmetry, there are other light moduli. The idea that these could play some role in inflation is not new, and I, the the earliest example I know of is a, some early papers by Banks in the 90s, but there may be or things earlier still. Okay, but I want to add a few new. I'm going to add a few new elements. Okay, now I'm going to assume some degree of low energy supersymmetry to justify the existence of these moduli themselves. So these moduli will typically be partners of axions, and 
uh, and there'll be light as a consequence of some approximate supersymmetry. Uh, and, uh, and, the, and I'm gonna talk about a parallel between large and small fields in this context uh, bet uh, between what I'll refer to as large and small uh, field solutions to the strong CP problem. So in this remaining part of the talk, I'm going to review uh, a little bit small field hybrid inflation, some general issues there. Uh, I'm going to talk about large and small field solutions to the strong CP problem. Okay, and actually, the th say these two these two topics will in uh, take most of my time. Okay, then I'll say a little bit about what what we what in what would it mean to talk about inflation with non-compact moduli and the ingredients we would need for successful modular inflation. Uh, and I'll talk then a little bit about uh, the outlook for large field uh, hybrid inflation. I actually won't talk much about this large field excursion in moduli space. Okay. So let me just remind you a little bit about what hybrid inflation is. Okay. Uh, it's often described in terms of fields and potentials with rather detailed special feature features. For example, uh, often there, there's, there'll be a lot of discussion of a thing called the waterfall field. Um, but it can be ca characterized in a more conceptual way, which is helpful, I think, for this larger problem. Uh, okay, inflation occurs in all such models on a pseudomodulized space in a region where uh, almost all these models, I should say, have some approximate supersymmetry, and in a region where supersymmetry is badly broken. Uh, I should say not only by possibly, but by an amount larger than in the present universe, and where the potentially is slow, potential is slowly varying. Okay. Uh, and essentially, all hybrid models in the literature that I'm aware of are small field models, and this allows quite explicit constructions using rules of conventional field theory. Uh, but it is not clear, as we'll see, that small field inflation is selected by any deeper principle. Okay. So let me just describe for you the simplest supersymmetric hybrid model. So it looks like this. Okay. So it has a superpotential W, uh, which is I, I is going to be the inflaton. Uh, it's some constant kappa times phi squared minus mu squared. This phi is the thing known as the waterfall field. Okay, uh, and classically for large I, this potential is independent of I. Okay, so if I make I large, okay, uh, effectively what that does is give a large mass to this field phi. Okay, uh, and so the phi field just sits at the origin. Okay, and the classical potential just looks like mu to the fourth. Okay, it's independent of I. Okay, and the quantum, correct, quantum mechanical corrections then just to control the dynamics of inflation. So the potential for I arises, supersymmetry is broken. There's a potential for I, it looks like this. Mu to the fourth, one plus, I think I've got the constant right, kappa squared over 16 pi squared, log I squared over mu squared. Okay, so this is the slowly varying potential for the inflaton. So this, this, this theory is constrained. Kappa is constrained to be extremely small in order that the fluctuation spectrum uh, uh, be of the correct size. Okay, so in fact, it's proportional to uh, the energy during inflation. And I've written a formula here for it. Uh, kappa is, uh, uh, turns out to be 7.1 times 10 to the fifth. That looks like a small, large number, but this is times mu over mp squared. Okay, so if the scale of inflation is, is 10 to the 14th GV or something, this is, uh, this is a number of order 10 to the minus 8. If it's smaller than that, it's, it's smaller still. Okay. Now, this, the, the problem with any sort of such analysis, even for small field models, is that we can't ignore Planck suppressed corrections to the, to the effective action. Okay. And among those, we could look at corrections to the Kähler potential. So in particular, for example, we could write down a quartic term in the potential in the inflaton field. Okay, so here kappa is alpha over mp squared i dagger i, i dagger i. Okay, and this gives, already gives too large a correction to this parameter eta, the slow roll parameter, unless this number alpha, which nominally you would say is order one, okay, uh, is of order 10 to the minus two. Okay. So I would claim this is a sort of irreducible fine-tuning required even for small field inflation. Okay. Now, there are also corrections to the superpotential, which one can write. 
Okay, so, uh, so we could write terms like i to the n over mp to the n minus three. Okay, uh, and at least the low order, the low n terms must be suppressed. Okay, uh, and in fact, if the scale of inflation is to be high, you have to express, uh, the higher the scale, I should say, you have to, re the more powers you have to suppress here. So the larger sort of discrete symmetry or whatever, or what have you, you may need to account for the required structure of this, of this superpotential. Okay. All right. So that so 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 there's sort of a thing that so that sort of points towards lower scale in inflation. Okay. Kappa sort of goes in the other direction. Okay. As we saw, kappa gets smaller as the scale gets smaller, and that's also a mystery one would have to explain. Okay. Uh, and finally, given achieving ns less than one, consistent with the, or significantly less than one, consistent with the Planck satellite results, requires a balance, balancing of Kähler and super potential corrections, which is which is, is somewhat looks kind of contrived. And indeed, if you look at the abstract of the Planck theory paper from a couple years, a few years ago, it starts by saying the simplest hybrid inflationary models uh, on monomial potentials of degree n greater than two do not provide a good fit to the data. Okay, so the theoretical arguments for small field in, over large field inflation are hardly very persuasive. Okay, so even at low scales, we have to control Planck scale corrections, and we have some tuning of parameters, uh, and one also needs some very small dimensionless number, progressively smaller as the scale of inflation becomes smaller. Okay. All right, so. I think the lesson from this is that it's clearly interesting to generalize hybrid inflation to large fields. Okay, so I basically said hybrid inflation is really not this a story of this particular model with a mod, with a uh, with a waterfall field and so on, but it's uh, uh, but it's really should be thought of in terms of some kind of pseudo modulized space. And we're quite familiar in string theory with modulized spaces in which fields have have Planck scale variations. Okay, so let me first, though, consider another situation where this kind of small field, large field dichotomy arises. Okay, again, just to sort of motivate how this might look. Okay, and this is the con in the context of the strong CP problem. Okay, so, uh, so if one tries to solve the strong CP problem with an axion, if one imagines that solution, one has to account for uh, an, ac uh, an accidental global symmetry, which is of extremely high quality. Okay. Uh, so uh, small field. So we could here also talk about small field solutions, and this is sort of typical of models that people construct. So most models designed to obtain a Pitchet-Quinn symmetry are constructed with a small axion decay constant, F a far less than m Planck, with F a arising as the expectation value of some field. Okay, the field transforms under some approximate global symmetry. Okay. And we can organize the effective action of the theory in powers of phi over mp, since phi is small. Okay. And what we need is, the, uh, is the, uh, this axion of good quality. I've written a kind of formal definition of what I want. I want, I can define a quality factor for the axion, which is one over fa times uh, ma squared, partial v, partial a. Okay. Uh, this is uh, 10 to the fourth FA partial V partial A. That has to be less than 10 to the minus 11. Uh, this V, I should say, is the Pacheco-Quinn symmetry violating piece of the potential. Okay. So in small field models, if phi contains uh, the axion field, we need to suppress operators of the form phi to the n over mp to the n minus 3 up to very high n. Okay. For example, one might achieve that with a Zn with n greater than 11 or more, depending on the values of Fa. Okay. But this is not a very satisfying story or satisfying explanation. Okay. Uh, and there's, uh, 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 for a long time, another viewpoint on this problem, which has been suggested by string theory. Uh, so as, as Witten pointed out long ago, uh, string theory often exhibits axions. Uh, 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 which exhibits some continuous shift, shift symmetry and some approximations, for example, perturbatively in the string coupling, and which are non-perturbatively broken, uh, but for which, a, uh, getting back to menandromy, usually a discrete symmetry is left exact. Okay. 
Now, FA depends on the precise form of the axion kinetic term. Okay, the non-compact moduli which accompany these moduli typically have blank scale BEBs. Okay, and I'm going to call A the full chiral axion superfield. So I'll call A as S some scalar plus IA. Okay, uh, and the periodicity in A, this two pi periodicity, implies that for large S, uh, in the superpotential, the axion appears as e to the minus A. Okay, so. If, you, if we're in such a regime, then solving the strong CP problem requires typically suppressing only a small number of possible terms. So rather than having to suppress this vast number of operators that one has in the, in the, uh, uh, in the small field case, uh, one has to suppress only a few terms. Okay? Now, the story is typically complicated. Okay, we don't really know if this happens in string theory. There are typically several moduli which have to be st uh, well, uh, stabilized. This is certainly not a well understood problem. There are lots of speculations with varying degrees of plausibility. Okay? Uh, but whatever the mechanism, if this is the right picture, the axion multiple is special. For example, the super, if the superpotential plays a significant role in stabilizing the saxion, it would be hard to understand why the axion would be light. So the, uh, the, the, the saxion, the, the, the magnitude of this e to the minus a, it has to be accounted for by, uh, uh, by things they say involving the Kähler potential. Okay? So anyway, there's some complicated story here, but this is a, an alternative view, which I, think, which I think has greater plausibility, even though we can't really realize it explicitly, uh, or you know, in terms of something where we can do some reliable computation uh, in string theory. Okay? All right, so with that point of view, so that's kind of another reason, I think, why would these kind of in regions of, of the moduli space might be of interest, okay? Both of them are on sort of more phenomenological, and I, I guess this gets back to uh, some of the lessons we learned in the morning, more phenomenological than sort of principled, okay? But still reasons we might think about these regions, okay? So anyway, as I say, the strong CP problem points to Planck scale regions of field space as the arena for phenomenology. Okay, uh, and so we can ask whether these these might be the regions, these might be the moduli which play the role of this, uh, if you like, of these inflatons for hybrid inflation. Okay, to, for that to work, there are a lot of things that have to happen. Okay, uh, so for example, in the present epoch, we probably want one or more moduli to be responsible for some hierarchical supersymmetry breaking. I'm not necessarily advocating that supersymmetry is broken at uh, just above the weak scale, though that would be nice, uh, but just that uh, this whole picture sort of holds together. Okay? Uh, in the present epoch, we also want a modulus whose superpotential is highly suppressed. This is this statement about e to the minus a, not wanting e to the minus a. Uh, or the terms involving e to the minus a and the potential being suppressed, uh, and whose compact component is the QCD axion. Okay, this isn't necessary for inflation, but it is the essence of a modular uh, large field solution to the strong CP problem. So at an earlier epoch, we need a stationary point in the effective action with higher scale supersymmetry breaking and a positive cosmological constant. We need a field with a particularly flat potential, which is the candidate for the inflaton for a slow roll. Okay, and we need some dynamics such that inflation ends. Okay, so uh, I said, well, the waterfall field is an important part of the story, but something, there has to be some dynamics where you transition between these different regions. Okay, um, and I'm viewing this for the moment as phenomenological statements. I don't have a conception right now of how uh, one would derive this structure from a particular string construction. Okay. Uh, a few comments, the fields, uh, fields need not play the same role in the inflation area as they do now. For example, the Pacheco symmetry might be broke, badly broken during inflation, okay, just depending on which of these exponential terms are important. Okay, the axion then might be heavy during uh, this period, and isocurvature fluctuations, for example, might not be an issue. Uh, in, that, in a case like that, I should note that the initial axion mi misalignment angle would be fixed rather than being a random variable, so some of the way we think about axion dynamics would change. Um, yeah, this is, I don't know that that's that relevant. We can skip that. Okay, and as I say, I'm not going to explore particular models here, uh, but simply state one can construct, you know, kludgy kinds of models uh, which, which implement the various criterion I've described here. Uh, some general features, though, they're typically involved tuning. 
uh, the lower, uh, and I should say, the lower the scale of inflation, the greater the level of tuning. So I'd like to say that that's kind of a statement that uh, that we would expect R to be as large as it can be com compared to uh, the limits we have now. Uh, and I should add that over some range of field range, because of this rather slow logarithmic variation of of the uh, the typical slow logarithmic variations of the kinetic terms for these fields one sees in string theories, these often end up resembling chaotic models. Okay, so just to summarize a little bit and conclude, uh, infl uh, explaining inflation from an underlying uh, microscopic theory is an extremely challenging problem, and it's prob perhaps quite possibly inaccessible to our current theoretical technologies. Okay. Uh, even in small field inflation requires control of Planck scale phenomena. Okay. Uh, within string theory, all this requires understanding of supersymmetry breaking, whether it's large or small, fixing of moduli in, in the present universe as well as at much earlier times. It requires an understanding of cosmological sing singularities uh, and perhaps something like a landscape. So, so there's a lot we don't know. So as I say, at best, one can try and develop some phenomenology with this. Um, uh, as I say, we would like to understand what are some generic features, uh, and um, uh, <clears throat> I'm sorry. What did I want to make? What point did I want to make here? Uh, yeah, I just uh, yeah, I just again want to stress this point that the string string moduli form a these non-compact string string moduli are kind of a natural setting. There's a parallel. Uh, with uh, for the with the possible role of inflation, with their role in uh, understanding a solution to the strong CP problem, uh, and I say, say I think uh, for the strong CP problem, these look even though again we can't be that explicit as a phenomenology. This looks as uh, as plausible as uh, more plausible, I should say, than other ways we have of understanding this problem. Uh, yeah, I think. Yeah, I think of these things I've said. Um, so just uh, a couple general outcomes, they're, they're pretty weak, but you can say that higher scales of inflation would seem to be preserved. Okay, and in this kind of story, high-scale axions uh, are also, also seem, seem most likely. Okay, so I think there I'll quit. I think that's all I wanted to say. Okay, uh, and I want, again want to thank the organizers uh, for the privilege of speaking here. value of FA are you uh, partial to? Um, so I'm, uh, it's pretty hard to, to reconcile, it, it's not too hard to reconcile FA of about 10 to the 15th GeV with facts we know. It's hard to reconcile, facts of cosmology we know, it's hard to recognize, reconcile larger FAs. So that's kind of, that's kind of my preferred range. Um, so that's out of the range, for example, of the ADMX experiment or things like that. There are, you know, as you probably know, there are proposals around now for experiments that might be able to probe those kind of, that kind of range. So uh, it, it's not out of the question that we, that we might be able to, to look at such things. Some of that, well, it, it, a lot of that is motivated by this sort of picture here. Uh, there, has, there was actually a recent lattice calculation on temperature dependence of axial mass, which disagrees with the standard the instrument calculation and raised the axial K constant by one order of magnitude. Right, 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 so, right. So right. that's kind of going in your direction. Right, 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 right. Though in this sort of picture, it's, it's I mean, getting back to John's question also, uh, in this sort of picture, it doesn't seem likely that the standard thermal picture holds you know, holds back really far. So for example, if there are these non-compact moduli, okay, then almost certainly they dominated the energy density for a while. So, and parametrically, they're more significant, for example, than the axion. So, you know, so their decays, for example, if you like, dilute the axions and alter the, and alter the picture of production. 
So that's partly why, and, you know, and, uh, and actually I should say this 10 to the 15th bothers me a lot that I mentioned. It's really a little less than that. It's sort of 10 to the 14.5 or 6 or something, if you're honest. Uh, and, um, and I would, I, 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 I'm, I, I, it, it sort of bugs me a little bit. I sort of wonder whether how, ro you know, that number feels robust, but I wonder if it's really, if that upper limit is really correct. And any comment on this argument by Tech Martin Wilczek that uh, uh, X and K constant, initial misalignment is also a topic, so that higher X and K constant is okay. Well, the, the, I had one comment here, which is that I, I certainly don't know the answer, but I, I, I have a sort of prejudice that for a while now that basically that it's quite possible that the Pacheco-Quinn symmetry is badly broken during inflation, in which case the theta is not a random variable but is fixed. Okay, now it may still be that you want to think about some landscape or something and that's fixed as a function of some other parameters which have some distribution, but that it's not necessarily a free-floating random variable. But I, I, I don't, in a deep way, know the answer. And, you know, and, and the question of whether, the question of how robust an anthropic argument there is for, you know, it's kind of independent, really. I mean, from short, something you've thought a lot about. Uh, the question of whether there's a robust anthropic argument for the dark matter density is, you know, is clearly an interesting one. Uh, and, you know, could bear on all kinds of issues including these. Do you have an opinion about that? How robust do you think it is? Well, so, so the, the argument was basically causing all the structures to forge the black holes in the end, right? Right. So I, I, I don't know how actually robust that analysis was. Right, yeah, I don't, I, 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 I've looked at it and I don't understand, I don't, I'm not sure. Other questions, comments? All right, let's thank Michael Ryan. Thank you.